Will you begin, please? The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. May God bless the reading of his word to our minds and our hearts. Well, in case you hadn't noticed, it's New Year's Eve, which means some of you might be thinking about, you know, resolutions. You might be thinking of ways to, uh, to uh, make some improvements in your life, um, I'm facing something this year that's been quite challenging to me. It's my first football season without cable TV, and uh, oh, it's 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 been a burden. Uh, but God has given me the strength to endure for sure, um, and I'm going to keep that resolution going into the new year as well. But the best resolution that you could possibly make, the best resolution that you could ever make, is this: hiding. God's word in your heart. There's no resolution, I don't think, that's better than that. You might think, well, I could lose a few pounds, I could get more exercise, yada, yada, yada. But the best thing you could do is to hide God's word in your heart, making God's word a part of your daily routine. And so today, the elders and I will give you some practical suggestions. But before we get to the practical suggestions, I wanted to give you a little bit of background, history of God's word. And so I'm going to look at three words that start with the letter C canonicity, and you're saying, what's that, Pastor Jim? You're going to find out. Um, Content and communication. So we're going to talk about those three C's. Uh, The, uh, you know, the alliterative uh, disability that I have, um, I guess it's an occupational hazard. So anyway, we'll start with canonicity. Canonicity means these are the words, these are the books of the Bible that that the church has established as being God's word. And we'll get into what those are and why they, why they chose those. As the early church sprang up, and remember, this happens right after the, the, the day of Pentecost. Things are going wild. People are coming to faith. And Paul's out there preaching the gospel around the world. And all these churches start springing up, and people are coming to faith in Christ. But when you have that, you have another situation. And that is that false teachings arise too. Heresies began to arise. And I won't go into the details of what those are. You can check a a church history book and find out some of what those are. And so the the church leaders thought to themselves that to combat these heresies, we need to establish kind of a codified, standardized understanding of what God's word is. What are the teachings, the authoritative teachings of the Christian faith? And so they began to establish what's called the canon of Scripture. And in 397 A.D., the Council of Carthage established the Orthodox New Testament, uh, the canon of the New Testament. And basically, they gave their approval to the 27 books that we have in our New Testament. You say, well, what about the Old Testament? The Old Testament had been canonized before that. It had been around a whole lot longer. And so those words had been canonized, I believe, in about 250 A.D. And so this was now establishing the entire canon of Scripture. The word canon literally means read or measurement. It's a measurement. And so the standard by which the books were determined to be inspired by God was established. And here are some of the criteria that were used. And, um, and you may read articles that have slight nuances and variations on these, but these are the four basic ones. First of all, apostolic origin. Was the book written by an apostle of Jesus Christ or by someone who is very closely associated with an apostle. Take the Gospel of Mark. Mark was not technically an apostle of Jesus Christ, but he was informed, most scholars believe, by Peter. So really, Mark could technically be the Gospel of Peter, some have suggested. Uh, And then the second idea is the reception by the churches. Did the churches receive these words as being authoritative, as being from Jesus Christ and from the apostles? 
And then the third criteria is, was there consistent doctrine? So was it consistent with what the apostles were teaching? All those went together to establish uh, what we call the canon of Scripture, specifically the New Testament. So that wasn't too painful, was it? Okay. Now we're up to content. The Bible is divided into two testaments. Most of you, uh, this is basic uh, stuff for, for us, but just to remind us, it's divided into two sections, the Old Testament with 39 books, the New Testament with 27 books, and here's the graphic that kind of uh, points that out to you. The Old Testament is about God's people, about the nation of Israel, and it has several sections. This graphic calls the first five books the law, but most scholars call it the Pentateuch, which basically means the first five books. And it starts with Genesis, which of course begins with creation. And then after creation, there are several uh, episodes and we get to the story of Abraham. And that really takes up the rest of the book of Genesis. Abraham, his son Isaac, his grandson Jacob, his great grandson uh, Joseph. It takes up most of the rest of the book of Genesis. We go to the book of Exodus, and that's a key book because when we get to Exodus, we find out that God's people have been enslaved by the nation of Egypt. And God selects a man by the name of Moses to go in to Egypt and to get their their freedom and get their deliverance from the people of Egypt, from the land of Egypt. And that's what a lot of the book of Genesis is about. But then it also comes where Moses brings God's law to the people of Israel coming up down from Mount Sinai, gives them the Ten Commandments that we're familiar with. And then we start to see the nation of Israel become a nation. That takes us into the books of history where Israel really becomes a nation, starting with the book of Joshua, where they conquer the promised land and where they divide it among the 12 tribes of Israel on to the books of Samuel, uh, Samuel and uh, Kings and Chronicles where we see the kingdoms established and, and set up and where we see our favorite king of all get a lot of press and that's King David, of course. But then we, we go into a period uh, after David's son Solomon was king, his grandson had a revolt and it led to the divided kingdom and ultimately because the people of Israel failed to obey God and believe in God, it led to them being exiled in the land of Babylon for 70 years. That, my friends, is quite a time out. You know you've behaved poorly when you get timed out for 70 years. Basically, a whole generation of people. But then they were able to come home those who survived and the new ones who were born in Babylon came home, repatriated the land of Israel. We read about that in Ezra and Nehemiah. That's after the Babylonian captivity. Then there's a section called wisdom literature, which is very familiar. Psalms, um, the Psalms, the Proverbs, Job, and so forth. And uh, just words about how to live our lives in a way that honors God. Wisdom is just that. It's based on experience. It's based on knowledge that we can now kind of know how to live our lives. Then there was the prophets. Now the prophets were people, were men who spoke from God to the people of Israel. Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel, those are some of the best known ones. Daniel, of course, as well. And, And these were people who spoke God's word to the people of Israel, a lot of times warning the kings of Israel about their behavior and what they were doing that was contrary to God's will. Some of the kings said, oh, you're right, and did some self-correction. Not many of them, though. Most of them kept doing what they were doing, and that's why we ended up with the Babylonian captivity. So we switch over to the New Testament, the Gospels, which are the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we come to the book of Acts, which is when the Holy Spirit came, and when the church got established. We read all about that in the book of Acts. We go to Paul's letters, which were letters that Paul wrote to specific audiences, specific churches, dealing with specific problems. And we saw that uh, earlier this year when we went through the book of Galatians, the problem that that church was going through. Uh, and, And these letters were written specifically, but they have a general application to us as well. And then there's the general letters, which were written universally to Christ's followers. And finally, the book of Revelation, which is the New Testament's 
book of prophecy. So that's a quick overview of, of the Bible. And so you can understand where each of those books kind of fit into the overview of Scripture. Now I want us to think a little bit about communication. I read an article online and I thought, this article is great and I wish I remember the author's name, I don't. But he gave a really good digested overview of the uh, formulation of Scripture, the translation and transmission of Scripture. And the process of gathering and transmitting these ancient documents had to be painstaking, had to be terribly complicated. I saw an article in the, in the news feed last week about a, I forget what school it was, it might have been Dallas Theological Seminary, where they had, a, they had gotten a piece of papyri, which was basically, I don't know, two by four inches, not terribly big at all, and they were painstakingly studying this piece of papyrus to see where it fit into Scripture. And it's just, a, like I say, a grueling, painstaking task but that's what was going on. You and I can't imagine it because we type up emails, we send texts, we type letters and, and our word processors, we do all that stuff without even thinking about how easy that is to do. And I, I bet there's very few of us that still sit down with a pen and a piece of paper and actually write a handwritten note or card to somebody. We might say love so-and-so, but other than that, we might not do that anymore. That's a kind of a dying art, I think. But that's how Scripture began. The gospel writers using papyrus would, would inscribe what they experienced, what they remembered. And if you've seen any of the episodes of The Chosen, you might remember there's an episode where John is literally sitting at a table scribbling his thoughts on this piece of paper, his memories and his, of his experience with Jesus. And it's, it's, it's an interesting idea how hard that was to communicate and yet how faithful they were in doing it. And so then as the, the Gospels and the New Testament was being gathered together, verifying whether these documents were actually legitimate and, and whether they contained the words of the, the authors that they thought they contained, but then gradually manuscripts were being gathered. Theologians and scholars and even pastors decided that it was necessary to communicate God's word to the people in a language that they understood. In a language that they understood. And it started with a man named St. Jerome, about 400 AD, who translated the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament into Latin. And it was referred to, called the Latin Vulgate. And it's interesting, the author suggested that the reason it was called Vulgate was because the Latin that Jerome used was the Latin of the everyday people. And it was considered, quote unquote, vulgar. So that's where the idea of the Latin Vulgate came from, according to this author. Time went by, and in 1300, uh, 1300s, John Wycliffe decided it was time for the English-speaking people to have a, a Bible in their language, and so he translated the Latin Vulgate that Jerome had translated into Latin. He translated that into English, and uh, that was not viewed as a positive step by some people. In fact, uh, after, after John Wycliffe passed away, um, people, they, they dug up his bones so they could burn them. You got to be really ticked at somebody to do that, you know. You really have to be angry at them. But they were. They were angry at Wycliffe. They saw him as a heretic because he had translated Holy Scripture into English. Then we come to the mid-1400s. A very significant event happened then when Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press. And one of the first books that he decided to publish was, yes, the Bible. 1525 or thereabouts, uh, William Tyndale came along and he translated the Hebrew and Greek scriptures into English and like John Wycliffe, he was seen as a heretic and so they publicly strangled him to death and as if that wasn't enough, then they burned him at the stake. Again, you got to be really ticked at somebody to kill them twice. Now, Martin Luther didn't face those kind of situations, mainly because he was hidden away in the Wartburg Castle, perhaps. And here's a picture of the Wartburg Castle where, uh, where we visited earlier. 
uh, in December, and where we actually saw, that's the picture from my phone, where we saw the, the, uh, the place where Martin Luther translated the scriptures into German. In 1522, he translated the New Testament. 1534, he translated the Old Testament into German. Now, due to the printing press and the plethora of translations that were kind of coming out and being printed, it sounds like from what I was reading, like it was a little bit like the Wild West. And so King James decided, and this is about 1604, he ordered a, defin a definitive translation of scriptures into English. King James, hmm, that sounds familiar. Oh yeah, the King James Version, which many people still use, and it certainly has been updated over the years, but that's the standard that has been guiding Christianity for many, many years. So just some concluding words that I want us to think about before we move into the practical side of this conversation today, and that is, first of all, God's Word is incredibly valuable. Think about the value of God's Word, the living Word of God that we all have access to. People like William Tyndale gave their lives because they believed so firmly that this was important, that people have the Word of God. His goal was to get Scripture into the hands of ordinary people so people could read and learn about God on their own. And now, in 2023, almost 2024, there's a plethora of Bibles. So many Bibles. In fact, I'll get to probably pretty soon get the, the Christian book distributor's catalog of Bibles. And now we've gotten to where we want specific Bibles for specific audiences. So, if you're a, a balding left-handed guy, you know, you can have a Bible. I'm, I'm not left-handed. John is, but... Uh, <laughs> so, th there's probably a Bible specifically for your, for your demographic. Yeah, that's how it's going now. Everybody's, their specific demographic, we've got a Bible specifically for you. Uh, and to me, it just seems like a bit much. I think we can all open a Bible, read it, understand what it's communicating to us. I was thinking about the number of Bibles I have in my life, and you could think for a minute, how many Bibles do you have? And I'm almost embarrassed to tell you that up in my office, there are 15 Bibles that I own. Just over the years, one that my parents gave to me when I was a little boy, one that they gave to me when I was ordained, one that my church, home church in Ohio, gave to me when I was ordained, one that I inherited from my mom after she passed away, uh, and, and on and on and on. Uh, and just, you know, I re received Bibles as gift along the way. Fifteen Bibles. And I think I've got another ten at home. Some of which I inherited from Stephanie. But that's a lot of Bibles. And I just think the plethora of Bibles might make us take what we have for granted. We have the living word of God available to us to be in our hands, to be in our minds, to be in our hearts. So it's important to not lose our appreciation for the privilege we have and not take that for granted. Another thought is that God's word is incredibly valuable. Another thought is God's word is powerful and effective. That's what it tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. Joint and marrow it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Those of you who have been around, have been believers for a long time, you may have read through the Bible a few times. You may have read the same passage and maybe one, one time you read the passage and you got this out of it, this application out of it. And then a year or so later, you read it again, you got this application out of it. And you say, well, how does, how does it do that? Well, it's living and active, that's how. It's a living word. When I visited uh, the place we refer to as Long Beach in North Africa back in 2021, I was, the worker who was there, missionary was there, was taking me on a guided tour of his, his town. And he introduced me to this shopkeeper, a young man who is also a spiritual seeker, and also I could communicate him with him in English and with no problems at all. 
And he asked me this question, which I thought was insightful. He said, you've probably read the Bible a lot. And I said, yes, I have. I've read it several times through. And he said, when you read a passage, is it start, does it seem like you've never read it before? And I said, well, that's an insightful question, but yes, you're right. There are times when I read a passage and I think, I know I've read this before, but there's some words here that I don't remember reading before. There's, there's something here that the Holy Spirit wants me to grab a hold of this time. And that's why I say it is powerful. It is powerful and effective. The Holy Spirit illuminates God's word. And so as we begin to read God's word, it's very important for us to, to come to God in prayer. Every morning before I read my Bible, I, I come before God in prayer. And I say, Holy Spirit, I need you to open my mind and heart to this truth that I'm about to read so that I can apply it to my life. Another thought is that God's word was inspired uh, by God. Above all, it says in First, uh, Second Peter 1, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's an interesting way to describe what we call inspiration. People were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So God spoke through humans, through their personalities. And the, but the thoughts and ideas that were communicated came from the Holy Spirit, but through the personality of the writer. The fourth idea I want us to think about, and then we'll get on to some practical stuff, is that God's word helps us to live lives that please him. From 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Sometimes I've heard people refer to God's word as being like an owner's manual. And I think that's, that's an interesting and I think appropriate kind of expression for if you, if you get something, uh, a new vehicle for instance, and a light comes on, you want to know what that light is, or you want to know what your tires need to be inflated to, or all, all those kind of questions that you need to understand about your vehicle, they're in, the answers are in the owner's manual. And so for us, the answers about how we live lives that please and honor God are in his word. In, in Psalm 119.11, it says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So, question we're going to grapple with for the rest of our time together is how do we hide God's word in our hearts? How do we do that? Well, as I say, we begin with prayer and we ask God to make his passage, his word real and alive to us. We're going to talk about several ideas. One is you might have noticed this yellow uh, flyer on the back table or the back music stand where my notes usually are located, but this is basically a Bible reading plan for a year. You can read through the Bible in a year using a plan like this. This is put out by the navigators and it's a very helpful tool. If you'll notice, if you take a look at it, you'll notice that it doesn't just say, okay, we're going to start at Genesis and 12 months later, we're going to wrap it up at Revelation. It doesn't say that. It starts, for instance, if you would use this and tomorrow would be month one, it starts with Matthew. It also includes a passage from Acts, passage from Psalms, and a passage from Genesis. So you're reading four different locations every day so as not to get overwhelmed or bogged down. Also, the nice thing about this schedule is that it has 25 days every month. You say, well, most months have 30 days. True. You get a five-day period to catch up. So if you get busy, you get lose track, You've got five days that you can catch up with your reading and get back on track. So that's one option. Uh, the Bible, if you're a fan of the Daily Bread, the Daily Bread also has um, the Bible reading kind of schedule in it. It will give you a year, uh, Bible in a year, I think it is, at the bottom of the page. And you can follow that. Uh, another thing that you can do is kind of create your own reading plan. Now, I've put up a screenshot here of, of, of my, uh, from my phone of Bible Gateway. Bible Gateway is a great uh, software that you can use for, for a concordance. You can look up passages, you can look up key words, uh, and a lot of tools, but you'll notice on the graphic that's on the screen, up in the upper left-hand corner, it says, um, what does it say? Read the Bible. <laughs> and if, if, I couldn't see it on my screen there. Uh, if, you, uh, if you look on your computer screen, 
go to BibleGateway.com, and you can click on that Read the Bible section, and it'll give you a number of ways you can read the Bible. Read through the New Testament, read through the Old Testament, and, and just a number of reading plans that you can, you can use and kind of tailor-make to your own, uh, your own uh, thoughts and ideas. I'm going to skip my next idea and go directly to Charlie. Uh, not, not Charlie. It's uh, Dave and John are going to come and talk to us about another idea that they have. Well, I get to go first. So, one of the probably most popular ones people use is an app on their phone. And at this point, if you're a Christian, you don't have an app of some sort, the Bible app or something like it on your phone, or are you really a Christian, right? We all have some sort of Bible app on our phone, and they have Bible reading plans. And the Bible app has reading plans that will even read to you. So if you're like me and you drive a lot, you can even listen to it. So you really have no excuse at that point to listen to it. And some of the plans they have in there are partial plans. You don't necessarily have to go through the whole thing. They have themed plans, um, and they have whole plans, which will read through the whole Bible. And they even have a whole plan that will do it in 90 days. Now, that's a commitment. I dare you to even look at that one. <laughs> it's pretty involved. But then they do have some plans that are multiple years. So you don't have to necessarily squeeze it all into one year. Um, I encourage you to do that. But when you do that, you do kind of feel like you're skimming through some things pretty quickly. But one of the more popular plans that I like and my wife and I like is um, the Bible Project plan which I don't know if you're familiar with it at all, but Dave's, some of the Dave's studies that he does in the second hour are Bible project related, and he'll speak some more on it. But th what I like about their plan is they show a video. And in the video, they'll either walk you through the book you're going through a little bit, or some of the themes in the book, or just some themes that are happening throughout the Bible. So it kind of helps you focus, especially when you get into Leviticus and Numbers, on what is happening. And so we'll watch one of their videos right now.
Just a, a personal note, <clears throat> I have begun to start my day with Hear, O Israel, the Lord, your God, the Lord is one. You shall listen, eat. you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your might, and with all of your soul. And it's just a, a meaningful way to begin a day. Um, I'm also going to go off script here because you talked about the plethora of Bibles you have and versions available to us. If you have a computer with access to the internet, probably your phone too, but that's too small for me to see. If you have a computer with access to the internet, you can go to a, a website called eSword, one word, E-S-W-O-R-D, eSword, and you can get as many Bibles as you can read the rest of your life for free. Translations, languages, it's, it's there. Along with uh, Life Bible Gateway, they have commentaries and places for you to keep notes. It's, it's a great website. But actually, I'm supposed to talk about the Bible Project, so I will. <clears throat> have you ever opened the Bible and thought, where do I begin? What, which story is for today? Or if you have come to Christ recently, what is this about? Well, the Bible Project is, is intended to address a generation like ours. We're visual learners. It puts the Bible into visual format. And uh, as they have said, they, they want to help people experience the Bible in a way that is approachable, engaging, transformative. And they want to point out through all of their work that the Bible is one story that points to Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, it points to Jesus. Which, by the way, is consistent with us in the Alliance. Our founder, old A.B. Simpson, wrote a book that he called, I think he called it Christ in Every Chapter. And he, he claims that every chapter in the Bible points to Jesus. Uh, the Bible Project has all sorts of resources, whether you are a kind of casual person and you just want a quick uh, way to connect with God and, and, you know, I don't want to say do your duty, but you want to ground yourself in the right place, they have short videos like the one we just saw. If you want to go as deep as possible, they have literally seminary level courses. In fact, somebody told me you could take their, their course on Jonah and spend a whole academic year on it. I, I don't know if that's possible. You could do a course on 1 Corinthians or Exodus or going from Adam to Noah, from Noah to Abraham, um, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, even the art of biblical words. These are full-length seminary-type courses and the gamut in between. There are introductions to individual books. There are word studies. Whatever level you can, can engage, God will meet you there. The Bible Project has some kind of resource that will help you. So um, I will heartily recommend it. And eSword, too. Um, what else should I say? Oh, I, I want to say Bible Project is nonprofit and is crowdfunded, so you don't have to pay for it. It's free. And um, yeah, that'll do it. They trace the biblical themes but always there's this underlying idea, this points to Jesus. Uh, do you want me to call Art up, or do you want to introduce him? Or? Good morning. So I'm going to promote a, a Bible app called Mission 119. Pastor John Soper, uh, he was a Christian and Missionary Alliance pastor, missionary, professor, district superintendent, and vice president for church ministries. And um, in all that, he was on a mission. Uh, and his mission remained constant uh, for to equip others to know the word. And uh, he had one core belief that sums it up. He says, knowing and, and obeying God's word is fundamental to all true success. So o over the course of his ministry, he made two observations that led him to develop Mission 119. 
The first is, and Hebrews points it out, that anyone who engages in the word of God with an open heart and mind, uh, the word will change them. Uh, the second is that although Christians, most Christians believe that the Bible is the word of God, uh, they don't understand it well enough. A lot of people know what they believe, but can't articulate why they believe it. Uh, so, their goal with Mission 119 is to break through these challenges by providing an online and mobile Bible study that uh, meets people wherever they are, uh, whenever they're ready. So, Gina and I are going through the second time, through, um, and uh, what's good about it is like, we have a routine in the morning. You might want to follow it. It's we coffee, cats, and Mission 119. You might want to change it up a bit. But. So you, it, what it is is Pastor Soper, you, um, you can either read or listen to a portion of Scripture. And it's usually between 8 and 13 minutes. Uh, I like to listen to it and read it at the same time. And then Pastor Soper will give a commentary on it. And the, and the good thing about it is it doesn't just go from Genesis to Revelation. He goes with themes, and he'll go, if something uh, is relevant in an Old Testament, uh, in the New Testament, he'll go back and forth. So, so you're not just reading straight through. Um, and there's, there's, uh, it's free. It's in a free app. And a few things. You can search themes uh, any week or day. You can bookmark themes. And you can uh, track milestones. And their mission is for us to become fully devoted disciples that we've been called to be. So I'm going to read those two scriptures again that Jim uh, had. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. I used to think soul and spirit were the same thing, but if you look it up, they're not. Uh, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. In 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, all scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Uh, if you have any questions, you can see me after. It's, it's really easy to download and really easy to use. Charlie? Oh. Did I? Was that up there? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I did that. Um, Here's the, the, uh, like the home page, so you can read, listen, take notes, and uh, it gives your, uh, how far in, in it. And this is just your, uh, like a log of each day. So sometimes we f I forget to advance it, so the next day we listen to it again. We don't realize that we didn't remember it was the day before, so it's good that we listen to it a second day. <laughs> Obviously, we're more, more attentive to the coffee and the cats. Okay, uh, Jim mentioned the Bible as an owner's manual. I've heard it referred to as best instructions before leaving earth. Okay. Um, before I start, I, I'd like to tell you, uh, I once, uh, when I was working for General Electric, I took a course in effective presentation. And at the end, the um, instructor evaluated everybody. And he said, uh, if you ever wa wanted to uh, have somebody s give a funeral speech, it would be me. <laughs> so, uh, uh, John, Dave, and Art have talked about uh, you know, personal uh, study uh, with the Lord and spending time with the Lord, OK? But it's also uh, important to have community study and be involved with other people in the study of the Lord's word. And uh, at Community Chapel, we have s several opportunities. Uh, one is uh, second hour with Dave. Um, 
There are two women's Bible studies, which I can't tell you much about, but uh, there's one on Wednesday evenings at uh, 7 o'clock and one on Thursday morning, uh, and that's led by Beth, and one on Thursday mornings at uh, 10 o'clock that's led by Sue Johnson. Uh, and there's a men's Bible study on Saturday mornings, the first and third Saturday of the month at 8 o'clock, and that's led by Jim. And then we have a, a Monday night Bible study uh, at seven o'clock every Monday, uh, and we take turns leading that. Uh, and uh, we have a very diverse group on uh, Monday nights, uh, ranging from 15 years old to 80. And uh, you know, we, we have a good time uh, in studying the Lord's word. Uh, and uh, we get uh, down some rabbit trails sometimes, don't we, Al? <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> and, um, you know, we study the Lord's Word, but it's also about, uh, you know, uh, fellowship and camaraderie and, uh, and pizza <laughs> once, uh, once in a while. <laughs> uh, but, um, you, you know, you get a different perspective by, uh, by listening to everybody on the study. And um, as Jim mentioned, you know, you, you've read a passage many times, and um, somebody comes up with something on that passage, and you say, boy, I never thought of it that way. And uh, so it's a learning experience. Uh, and we end the evening with uh, prayer. Uh, we pray for our family, our friends our uh, community chapel family, and others. Uh, okay, thank you. Folks, we are blessed to have a group of elders in this church who care so deeply about us knowing the Word of God. And so thank you guys for, for, for what you shared. So New Year's Eve is here, and if you're thinking of making resolutions, as I said, the most important resolution you could make is to hide God's word in your heart and keep in mind God has blessed us with the treasure of his word and it's important for us to take advantage of this great gift father we thank you for this time we thank you for uh, all the different tools that are available to us to read your word and we just pray God as we face the new year that if if any of us have not had a regular routine of of digging into scripture, that this would be the, uh, 2024 would be the year that we do that, and that you would help us to not just have good intentions, but to have good follow through too, because your word is so powerful, is so, is so valuable, and we thank you for it. Through Christ we pray, amen. <laughs>